Season 2, Episode 3 of Strange Mile Radio. My name's Tobe Johnson. Thanks for joining us again. This show is brought to you, of course, by the good women over at Feral by Aaron, E-R-Y-N, Alchemy Sound Tools. Over at the Etsy store, type it in, all one word, Feral by Aaron, E-R-Y-N, and mention you heard about it on this show and something special will be packed inside that box. Also... Metallic Monsters, our new sponsor. I'm going to tell you more about them next episode and how you can have the monster of your dreams sitting on your own shelf. More than that. Piece of art. Okay, next up, Neil Waters and the Thylacine Awareness Group of Australia. There is breaking news. We'll be right back. Thanks again for being here, tuning in. It is uh, a wet, dreary Sunday here, the weekend before Easter. In fact, we thought it was Easter today, just based upon the fact that it usually rains around Easter time. But uh, we are coming up on the three-year mark of the Al Moon Knee Impressions, which if you don't know what those are, you can go to the YouTube channel and uh, watch some videos on that. But uh, these were some knee impressions that we cast with Daryl Adams and Cindy Adams down in Cottage Grove, Oregon. Since we're coming up on the three-year mark, that would be next Saturday on April 3rd, I'm going to do a, uh, I don't know, probably about an hour-long exploration of the knees here in my cabin. So that'll be in the evening Pacific Standard Time Just stay tuned to that on uh, mainly Facebook and Instagram. I'll post uh, exactly how that will happen. And uh, we'll do the whole thing from beginning to end, how they were cast, uh, the evidence that was laid out, and uh, go over it with a black light. Both these knee impressions are intact hydrocal or plaster pieces. Uh, One copy cast, right, of uh, these giant what look to be 1200 pound knee impressions in the substrate that have hair attached to the plaster that according to at least Cindy Dosen has come back as anomalous hair that don't match anything in the at least microscopic record as a match so that's going to be the third next Saturday April and then coming coming up on May 1st and 2nd Marcia K. Moore and Ira Wolfnosen and I and uh, some guests who probably just be sitting in the audience unseen. Maybe we can talk them to coming on camera or not, but uh, Marcia K. Moore of CMR Studios, most noted for a repatriation of the long heads or the Paracas skulls. Um, also looking into the world of a Bigfoot as well. It's going to be talking about uh, our forgotten culture, our unknown and almost alien culture, and the blending of the ancients with technology. A really interesting back and forth with Marcia and I. And also, as I mentioned before, Ira Wolfnosen of Heart Unafraid, who is going to be talking specifically about power spots, what they are, how you can access them, and what you may experience when you're there. Uh, She's lived in a couple. So that's going to be coming up again May 1st and 2nd. And just like we did before with the audio analysis conference, which was a a great success, a lot of fun for Scott Taylor, or yeah, Scott Taylor and I and uh, Kevin Carney to do, but uh, a lot of you tuned in. And uh, we learned some stuff from doing a conference like that, and we're going to add the additional element of a Q&A. So when you tune in, uh, you will have a Zoom link that you can chime into, come on camera, and I will invite you into the room, and we can interact with you virtually. And and it, it should be pretty flawless, just like it was before. I can't imagine any technical hiccups happening with this one, and it'll also be broadcast on YouTube and Facebook as well. So look forward to that coming up uh, not too far away now, um, May 1st and 2nd. And we also are going out on a field trip uh, that evening of the 1st and coming back to talk about where we went. We're, we're headed to a power spot to to have an experience and, uh, and talk about it the next day. So something different for you to do. Um, again, uh, I'll make a official announcement here next week, and you'll find out more about that at Strange Brow Radio and 
Facebook, and Instagram. Okay, coming up, this next guest, Neil Waters, Episode 7, way back, I think it was over two years ago, Alex Evans, uh, who I would call a repatriation of cryptid artists, uh, has been working hand-in-hand drawing the Tasmanian tiger, the thylacine, on behalf of common witness descriptions. Here we go. I mean, moving away from the world of Sasquatch into witness descriptions is something that shouldn't be there. At least this was, you know, accepted by science, but... Is this an endangered species or is this uh, a killed off species? Well, according to Any Waters and his game cam, which broke last February, he feels as though there's definitive evidence here. And so, yes, you can tune into this, and I'm glad you are as an audio medium, but if you would go to the YouTube channel, we have his photographic evidence there as well. And he's going to, he's going to explain uh, why this, uh, these photos here, these game cam photos here, should be accepted by modern day scientists and have you know rigorous debate, as he says, over the facts that remain on the game cams. So that's over at the Strange Brow YouTube page. Uh, do check that out. That uh, that is your source to subscribe and hit the little alert bell icon and and share that uh, episode because he needs your help sharing this episode in particular. Now it is a shorter episode. And I'll tell you why, is that Neil lives in Australia. (laughs) There's a big time difference. I think it was either 14 or 16 hours, something in that neighborhood, forwards in time from where I am in the Pacific Northwest, Pacific Standard Time. And he had the added bonus of being in the field with a leech on him. (laughs) And so that's how I'm going to start this episode out. I, I don't want to cut it because it really puts in perspective, uh, you know, how authentic Neil is as far as a Bushman. So from the bush with a uh, bloody leg and a soon to be dead leech is my conversation about the living and breathing thylacine with Neil Waters. Attacked by a leech here. Got blood. <laughs> There's blood everywhere, eh? There it is, little bastard. Ugh. One less leech. Sorry uh-huh. about that. Let's go. <laughs> all right. I love it. All right. Back with me again here, all the way back from episode seven, is Neil Waters with the Thylacine Awareness Group of Australia. Neil, how are you doing? Thanks for joining us. I'm very good. Thanks, Toby. Good to see you, mate. How's life over there? Yeah, all right? it's, it's good, but... Uh, let me just say I'm ecstatic uh, for what's happened over uh, the last two years for you because you came packing uh, back when we first started the show with uh, Alex Evans and tow and presented some really compelling evidence. Now, we're not going to be able to get to everything that you hashed over back in those days, but we don't really need to because now we're in a different category here where you have some really definitive, interesting evidence that's come forward here. So tell people what uh, has happened as far as thylacine evidence. Well, um, I was going through the trail cameras. Uh, We've got 60 odd trail cameras down in the bush at any given time here in Tassie uh, and more on the mainland. But I was going through the trail cameras and uh, discovered a series of photographs that were quite compelling because the first one that was very interesting was the nighttime facial shot of a very small animal um, but it was a nice frontal shot um, and um, about, but there's a really good frontal shot of what I believe is a juvenile thylacine. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the next shot is a daytime shot of what I believe is the rear end of the female mother thylacine. Um, the next shot after that is also daytime and um, very shortly thereafter, when you see the, the mother shot in the bottom right hand corner of the shot, you can actually see the nose of the little joey that's following the mother coming into to frame. So you can actually see in the bottom right hand corner, the nose of the juvenile. Next frame um, is the juvenile that comes into shot. Um, and then after that, what I believe is the adult male comes through as well. Um, and then I showed them to my committee and we uh, mulled them over for a few days. I already had arranged a meeting to go to the uh, Hobart Museum, the TMAG Museum, to show them some print casts, agreed to send the images to museum (laughs) okay hold that thought there for a second neil because 
Nick Mooney here has mentioned in a couple articles, the CNET article that I read upon the evidence came forth. Nick Mooney, um, why do people need to respect his opinion or do we? Um, well, a couple of reasons. Nick Mooney is an honorary to the museum, so clearly he's a man of, of knowledge and skill. Mm -hmm. He officially, I believe, he's a biologist and he specialises in raptors, as in eagles and birds of prey. Um, however, he was employed by the National Parks and Wildlife Service for about 35 mm -hmm. years as the official person who investigated um, thylacine sightings on behalf of the government. He collected mm -hmm. a lot of sightings. Um, so as far as being a thylacine specialist goes, I'm investigating sightings, essentially, um, and that's what I do as well. So mm -hmm. in many ways, I see Nick as my equal, um, even though I'm not university trained and I'm by no means a scientist or a biologist, but mm -hmm. essentially I do the same thing. I investigate sightings um, with a little bit less scepticism, I suppose, is what a scientist might apply to that because of the fact that I have so many overwhelming sightings that have so many um, similarities through them, you know, going back hundreds of years almost um, in Australia. Um, so yeah, Nick, Nick is an honorary to the museum. He's qualified as a biologist. So he's a man of, um, you know, experience in, in the field of, of animals mm -hmm. and, and science. Interestingly, he didn't report on the face room was the adult male. He only reported on two photos. That was one I said was the female and the joey. Um, daytime shots. So that's really interesting in itself that he, he didn't actually report on the other two shots. <clears throat> Had several vets and animal experts uh, that are judges for the Canine Association and the Feline Association, uh, plus wildlife carers. I've had collectively between five people, I've had 200 years of experience look at those photos and tell me that they're definitely not Paddy Mellons. Um, especially the joey. The joey is without a doubt a quadruped and not a baby paddy melon. Um, a lot of people, your listeners won't be aware of what a paddy melon is. So it's called a rufous wallaby. It's a small wallaby um, with a very fat bottom and a very narrow head. So when you have a look at our little joey and you see the buffy head and the wide body going all the way evenly along, you can see that it's clearly a long linear four-legged animal and not a hopping animal as in a macropod or a, a paddy melon rufous hair wallaby or Rufus Wallaby, sorry. Um, so it's um, interesting that Nick came back with a conclusion that it was a wallaby when so many other animal experts, including a vet with over 30 years experience, he's done a written report on it. He said it's marsupial and it's got four legs. So um, a lot of, lot of hot debate on, online and in the media about it all. Since there's a little de uh, delay here, I'm raising my hand. Um, not only do they say these things, but you have them on audio talking about this and the way that they speak about this game cam footage is very matter of fact. I mean, you are cross-referencing uh, one point after another with them. And when it gets down to the hawks of the, you know, the, the thylacine here, explain why that's important that the hawks are distinguished. Well, if it was a cat, it wouldn't have a smooth, black, shiny, leathery hawk. Mm -hmm. Cats do have hocks, but they have fur all over them. Now I've spoken to vets and I've spoken to uh, feline judges and they tell me the same thing. They, they, there was uh, four features about that animal, the baby in particular from behind, that make it not a cat. It's got a buffy head. It's got a very stocky body for such a tiny animal. If that was a kitten, it would be a lot scrawnier than that. Mm -hmm. It's got a dead straight tail um, and it's got very coarse hair. Um, four features that aren't cat-like. And my cat judge with over 30 years experience as an international feline judge said they're very uncat like features. So mm -hmm. to her, she wasn't convinced it was a cat. Um, she also didn't believe that it was a, a, a patty melon either. So, you know, those four features make it not a cat. Now we've had mm -hmm. a lot of online debating about whether it was a cat looking at the camera or a cat walking away from the camera, but it's simply not a cat. If someone can find a cat with those four features, that size, such a juvenile mm -hmm. little animal, um, be my guest, put the photo up. But so far, mm -hmm. no one has been able to put up a cat that looks mm -hmm. remotely like that animal. Okay. So given the, the fact that there's been some video and photographic evidence, you provided it two years ago. I still have some of your uh, slides that you put through here. People can go look up, uh, you know, yep. modern day sightings of thylacines. They can go to Thylacine Awareness Group of Australia and you can talk to witnesses, uh, you know, all day long that have current sightings. 
what is it about this game, Cam, that you think is going to move this conversation? Do you have something up your sleeve? Um, I imagine you're prepared to to go to bat for the thylacine at this at this time. Oh, mate, absolutely. Look, we, we kind of rushed our first video because I'd, I'd made the big, bold statement that we had these photographs. So I gave myself about a week to get those photographs together in a video. I do most of the filming on my own. John's in South Australia, you know, 1,200 kilometres away or whatever. He edited, edits it all back from there. So what we're doing now is we're getting a baby Paddy Mellon under one kilogram, which is what Nick described in his report. But we won't get a dead one, we'll get a live one and we will photograph and film it from the same distance. I've been back to the spot where the photographs were taken. I've got all the scale measurements for the whole area. We can work out within a few millimetres the exact size of the uh, baby thylacine joey that we've got a photograph of. And we're going to plonk the uh, cutout shots of our baby paddy melon under one kilogram as specified in its report put it next to the baby thylacine joey and um, put that back upon the museum to uh, now tell us exactly what we're looking at. Because I can guarantee you the baby thylacine will look a lot different than the baby Patty Mellon. Okay, what about as far as anything left behind by the group that was there, eDNA, uh, you know, in the tracks and such, are you doing anything uh, as far as collecting actual evidence that can be cross-referenced microscopically or DNA wise? Well, as you'd be aware, we've done a lot of DNA collecting over the years with scats that we've found. Um, we had one scat that came back, um, which was a positive hit for thylacine, but there wasn't enough DNA in it to get it over the line. It came back as Numbat. Numbat is the closest living relative to thylacine. Uh, same genome sequence for about 94%, I believe, and then one branch is often becomes a thylacine. And there's no Numbats in Tasmania. So to find a giant poo, you know, that's this big, with numbat DNA in Tasmania, you're basically looking at a thylacine scat. Because if a numbat, which is a tiny little marsupial from the mainland in Western Australia that lives on termites, if that mm. pushed that big poo out, it would have turned the numbat inside out pretty much. So we know that that was a thylacine scat and not a numbat scat. Um, then we got the little video of the one that didn't quite sit in front of the camera with the stripes on its bottom, but in the very first frame, you see that rounded ear of a thylacine. Now, Dr. Michael Archer went on the record stating that that was just a wallaby uh, with wet hair, um, and that's what gave it the striped appearance on its rump. But if you compare a wallaby's ear, a Bennett's wallaby or a Paddy Mellon, to that ear, I guarantee you that ear won't mm. match up at all because it's a thylacine's ear. So we've come very close a couple of times. This time, I'm convinced that we've got an absolute shot of a Joey thylacine. It showed us its face the night before. The next day, it showed us its bottom. Like you said before, it's got those two black leathery shiny hocks that marsupials have. This is why um, Dr. Mooney uh, at the uh, museum, I don't know if he's a doctor, sorry, but Nick Mooney has uh, stated that it was a, it was absolutely a marsupial because he said he thinks it's paddy melons because he recognizes those hocks mm -hmm. as being definitive marsupial features. However, when we prove that it's not a paddy melon, I'll go back to the museum and I'll say, well, here's the evidence to the contrary. Now, how many more animals have we got left that we can um, put up as likely candidates of what this may or may not be? It's like I said in, on the TV the other day, it's, it's more of a process of what it isn't rather than what it is. Because right. once we knock off all the other candidates, we're only left with really two options. It's a joey thylacine or it's a new species that no one's discovered. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to go with either. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just real quick, getting to the quote on your website here for the Thylacine Awareness Group of Australia. People can go there now and join up and there's uh, some patches and such for people that join in. One of the quotes here is, uh, is hope a bad thing? And I understand that just intimately from looking at the, you know, in the realm of Sasquatch talking about the, the conundrum here, but getting to what you mean by that quote, explain what you mean. Well, you know, a lot of the naysayers, I guess, or the skeptics, they, they sort of like to heckle about the psychology of what we do and how we're all living in hope and it's all a big dream and it's a psychological mm. thing rather than a physical thing. And I kind of get that to a degree, but you know, with people like me, I would get that. But when you get a random stranger that's never seen the animal before, describe it to a T and they'd never even heard of it till they saw it and they Googled what they'd seen, striped dog. 
um, it doesn't mm. really hold any any water, you know. So mm. hope is what we're in the business of because we believe that um, the world needs a few good stories at the moment. Um, and um, yeah. a friend of mine actually named this little Joey Thylacine Hope because that's what she represents. Um, and I think it's a female. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've called Hope a girl and um, we labelled her Hope because, you know, Hope really is a beautiful thing. It's, it's what everyone's hanging on to at the moment with the way the world's been with all this crazy COVID rubbish. Um, and all the backwards and forwards of the rules changing every day to suit the political mood. Um, let's face it, hope's a beautiful thing. And uh, we, we are in the business of delivering that. And mm -hmm. that's what we will do. We will just keep pushing this until we get it over the line, you know? I'm leaning into hope along with Neil here. Again, it's the Thylacine Awareness Group of Australia. What do you need from us besides more of a voice? I mean, I can only push this so far. I imagine you're probably... Uh, limited with time. Is there uh, anything that you want from the public here regarding? Yeah, what what I want is robust science discussion about this baby's photograph, actually. Anyone who considers themselves a scientist or a engineer that can get their calipers out and measure things, by all mm -hmm. means, get in touch with me and um, let's see exactly what we've got here in these photographs. I've mm -hmm. got all the measurements. We can work out the scale. Mm -hmm. We can work out the size of the feet from the measurements I've got. So um, it won't take much to place that animal in there and get some very good scientific based measurements that will be quite accurate um, to disprove what it isn't. Um, and I really want to see whatever scientist wants to approach me, come along and have a crack at it, by all mm. means, have a crack at it. Um, when you can prove to me it's a cat or a dog or a wallaby, I'll, I'll accept it. Mm -hmm. but, the challenge is out there for anyone to prove to me that that's not a thylacine. So that's what I really need from, from the community at the moment. Um, just healthy mm -hmm. debate about it. Um, and people that don't just sit there with an opinion, but actually bother to take the measurements and contribute to the discussion rather than just saying cat, 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 or, you know, what they were doing in Facebook. It was ridiculous. I just kept saying to the cat people, show me a photo of a cat with these features and you've got an argument until then you've got nothing. I've given you my evidence now show some evidence mm -hmm. that contradicts it or shut up <laughs> so yeah good point yeah so and, look, uh, if people you know, want to come on board with... and join us on youtube or on our group on facebook or you know um go onto the website have a look at the material we've got on there there's some good links to other things the, the important thing too tobe with all this is you know, Slateholm and Brooks have just done a paper where they've um, brought the date of extinction to the early 2000s and possibly not extinct at all. The official online museum for the thylacine, Natural Worlds, which is administered by Slateholm and Cameron Campbell, I think, two scientists from overseas, uh, UK, I believe. Now, that official website of the Thylacine Museum Online, they even state on there that they consider it an endangered species and probably not extinct due to the credible sightings. I provide a photo of a baby Thylacine Joey, proof of breeding. What more do we need for these morons to get off their mm -hmm. asses and actually go, oh, look, shit, it's there. We need to mm -hmm. act. You know, something needs to change. What are we going to do? You know, like... It's fucking pathetic, mate. It really is. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah I, can get, uh, I can get the urgency in your tone. And uh, I feel like it's important to get out as well. That's why I appreciate your time doing that. Again, the Thylacine Awareness Group of Australia, <laughs> Neil Waters is the man. And, um, I, you know, Alex Evans uh, was just excited as I'll get out. I imagine, I hope she was included into the, uh, you know, the first little primary as the uh, shots that went out there. And so um, it's great uh, leaning into this as much as I can and getting you here with me talking to you. I know you got to get back to uh, your busy day of uh, brushing off leeches, Neil. Um, I appreciate <laughs> your time. That's all right, mate. Look, thanks again, Tobin. I just wanted yeah. to get that bit in the end because it's important about the status of the animal, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thanks again, Neil. All right, that was Neil Waters and the Thylacine Awareness Group of Australia. Also, there's the Thylacine Awareness Group of Tasmania, which makes sense. Uh, check both of those out. The, uh, Neil, I need you to spread the word. And the best way to do it is to either share this podcast or go over to YouTube, 
like, subscribe, and uh, share that podcast as well. And shoot Neil Waters a message that you heard about it on Strange Brow Radio. Let him know that uh, his time was well spent. Now, you do need to go see Neil slap this um, slug, not slug, but leech off of his leg because that's prime television. And I have never got a leech before on me. Uh, I'm not looking forward to the experience if it ever happens, but... You know, he treated it like it was a common house fly, but a uh, super funny beginning. And it gives you, you know, the uh, the picture and the tone of how Neil is living during this interview. So uh, over 14 hours and time difference and doing the Lord's work again. So check that out. Hey, um, also coming up is the end. Easter is the poll close of Strange Stroll number four or five. And... Um, so you can vote now over at Facebook and uh, catch up on the old Strange Drills at the YouTube channel. And this is your chance to vote to send me to either Forks, Washington, home of the glittering vampires, <laughs> and uh, lichens galore, werewolves. And that is uh, right uh, about two hours away from my back door. So check that out. Or you can send me to Northern State Penitentiary, I almost said, Northern State Mental Asylum, also known as The Farm. Both of these probably haunted locations, given the fact of the mental asylum that uh, is well documented. Uh, but Forks is an interesting town, to say the least, right outside of, uh, I believe, the Macaw Indian Reservation. So interesting times to go out that way for sure. And then coming up, as I was saying, on May 1st and 2nd is the Marcia K. Moore Ero Wolfnosen. Now, what I'm left out in the beginning here but i buried the lead also is that jill remen snyder uh, kind of the brainchild behind flash of beauty the upcoming documentary that takes an introspection into sasquatch uh witnesses not so much sasquatch but the witness themselves and extended experiencers which we talk about here quite a bit is also going to be uh, zooming in at the very least and if she can come up and be on camera we'll do it that way but Jill has had a whole host of experiences and we're going to get her to talk about them with Marcia and myself so who doesn't want to hear more about ancient forgotten cultures with Marcia power spots with Ira Wolfness and how to access them and what will happen to you most likely when you go to one and uh, Jill Remensnyder and her personal connection to being a filmmaker and uh, the wife of a filmmaker and living and breathing for at least the last year and almost year and a half, extended experiencers in Sasquatch and this amazing new documentary coming out, I believe this year, Flash of Beauty. So that's coming up May 1st and 2nd. I'll tell you more about that coming up here in the next week. I think that's it. If you guys want to get in touch with me, here's how you do it. Go to Strange Brow at gmail.com, B-R-A-U's, how you spell that, or strangebrowradio at gmail.com. And just shoot me a message. Let me know you're listening to it, if there's anything here you want me to talk more about. Uh, I'm trying to do more filming. I've got uh, really good sound equipment and a great camera, so as soon as we can get on location to films, we, we generally do both now. So um, I hope you enjoy that. Oh, also, um, the last little update I'll say is that... Uh, if you haven't been to the Mima Mounds near Tumwater, Washington, near Olympia, Washington, uh, I went for the first time with my son last week, and we had an interesting experience on day one. We had an interesting experience on day two, and we may have walked away with what lo looks like to be uh, a serpent mound above the Mima Mounds. Now... That's under debate whether or not that's true, but uh, I visited the location, both of them, and uh, so the, the case goes on. So I, I can almost guarantee that uh, I'll be doing more podcasts in particular about the mound builders out here in the Northwest and video at the Mima Mounds, especially with my now dialed-in psionics Aurora Black. In fact, I still have some film to go over from the last time we were there and some audio, so... Anyway, uh, the Mima Mounds, get ready for more information on that. That's it for me. Thank you for listening. And of course, I will see you in the trees.
The following bonus audio is a clip from our Patreon members episodes. In regards to the Maury Island incident, this particular interview is with screenwriter of the Maury Island incident movie, Steve Edmiston. You know, and as a writer, it was a blast to write dialogue for J. Edgar Hoover. Who gets to do that? That was that was incredibly fun to try to sort of imagine a scene where we won't have that dialogue, but we have to fill it in, right? The scene between J. Edgar Hoover and, a, and an FBI field officer on a subject that is near and dear to Hoover's heart and use that scene to sort of to explain, you know, the the problems with, you know, the whole investigation of the Maury Island incident and what we will ultimately may never know, you know, what did Harold see? My conclusion and, and sort of my thesis on the whole episode from the FBI documents, from Jack Wilcox's own words, his own words, his and his own words to J. Edgar Hoover, my, my, I feel like the most important document in the whole case is an August 14, 1947 memo from Jack Wilcox, the lowly field agent in the gulag of the FBI. How, you can't get farther from the FBI power center than to be in Tacoma, Washington in 1947, right? Think about it, you're right? I mean, yeah, that's as far away as you can get. So that he is telling J. Edgar Hoover directly within hours after J. Edgar Hoover was misunderstanding and thought that Harold Dahl had confessed to a hoax, Jack Wilcox sends a teletype to J. Edgar Hoover and says, that is not true. Harold Dahl never confessed to a hoax. What Harold Dahl said was, I feel like I'm in so much trouble. I feel that I've been so ridiculed that now I'm going to invent a new story, which is I made it up. I'd rather be a liar then have to stand on, you know, saying what I saw was truthful. So it's his confession is actually what's untrue. It's it's a little bit twisted that way. But it's fascinating because that is verbatim what Jack Wilcox told J. Edgar Hoover. Um, and uh, little denouement on the whole thing was a great story out of the Seattle Post Intelligence or a few years back um, where uh, – a reporter that we had talked to followed up with Jack Wilcox's children on the story and, and wrote two articles, two detailed articles. And the children said, well, we never talked to our dad about this particular case, but they were both adamant. If our dad wrote something, it was truthful. Like he, he was a no BS individual his whole life and he did not exaggerate and he did not um, bend to power which was really useful for us as, you know, storytellers, you know, can we rely on what Jack Wilcox wrote? And that was kind of a nice, a nice way of thinking about it. 